Hello and good evening. Thank you everyone for braving the weather to come out. Uh, and welcome to the Fort Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Um, before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. This event is being video recorded and it will be available for free on YouTube and iTunes. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and we'll post it in a couple of weeks. Uh, you just get on our website and uh, click on the YouTube button. That's the easiest way to do it. If you are sharing a comment or a question, we ask that you speak directly into the microphones, that one or that one, uh, so that both the audience and the video camera will pick it up. Please understand that by speaking, you are giving the Fort Hall Forum permission to record you. Uh, and now, unless you are live blogging this forum, this would be a good time to turn off your cell phones. The Fort Hall Forum welcomes you and would like to thank our generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie May Education Foundation, and our partners here at Suffolk University, which, of course, serves as the forum's home base. The forum also thanks our members whose generosity makes uh, our free public events possible. Uh, someone here tonight was mentioning how great it is that we keep the forum free and that some other speaker series are decidedly not free. Uh, if you think that's great too, we would love for you to become a member. Um, in that way, you can keep it free for everyone else. Uh, we have membership envelopes right at the information table in the lobby. Uh, our moderator for this evening is one Miss Robin Abrahams. Robin Abrahams is the author of the popular Misconduct Social Advice column for the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine and of the book <laughs> and the author of the book Mind Over Manners. She has a PhD in research psychology and has co-authored articles in Harvard Business Review, Sloan Management Review, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Abrahams has a regular segment entitled Social Studies on WGBH Radio's Emily Rooney Show and maintains two blogs. Her previous jobs include theater publicist, editor, stand-up comedian, and professor of psychology and writing. Please welcome all of our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I will, in the great tradition of the cascading introductions, introduce my panelists, and, and then we will begin. So, Margot Mifflin. Margot? <laughs> is an associate professor in the English department of Lehman College of the, State of the City University of New York, Mifflin, and directs the arts and culture program at CUNY School of Grad Graduate School of Journalism, where she teaches arts journalism. She wrote the amazing book that is outside, The Bodies of Subversion, The Secret History of Women and Tattoo. Take a look through it, it's remarkable. She's written for the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, The Believer, Art News, and Salon.coms, and has appeared on MSNBC's documentary, Women and Tattoo, and CNN's Women of the Ink. Next to her is Bill Dowling, Downing, sorry, president of Mass Can Normal for 14 years. And currently, it's treasurer, one of two operations managers for the Massachusetts Coalition for Medical Cannabis, and was instrumental in garnering support for medical marijuana in Cambridge. Since 1991, he has been the primary orger of MCN's annual Fall Freedom Rally on Boston Commons. He has, maintains the MCN library and has a detailed knowledge on all aspects of the subject. Downing has been High Times Activist of the Month twice. And finally, Melissa Moore, whose bio is my favorite because it begins, has recently been dividing her time between writing a book about swearing and hiding it from her kids. <laughs> she received a PhD in English literature from Stanford University, specializing in medieval and Renaissance lit literature. She lives in Somerville, and Holy Shit, A Brief History of Swearing is her first book, and it is also a delightful read. So. Welcome to our panel, and let's get the conversation underway. The title of tonight's discussion is, Is Society Going to Hell in a Handbasket? Taboos, breaking taboos, and we can just, I think, refer to them all as, you know, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just, never mind their names, we're just going to call them, you know, tats, weed, and cussin' <laughs> up here. So, so, panelists, what, to your mind, is behind 
what really is a genuine perception that manners have all gone to hell, that, you know, on the civilization is disintegrating around us, the zombie apocalypse is around the corner. What's behind this sensation, and how do your particular areas of expertise, those being tats, weeds, and cussing, relate to those? Uh, well, certainly the problem is fear of change. Okay. Um, <coughs> things are constantly changing, and uh, the three things that we represent here mm -hmm. are changing, uh, and attitudes toward them are changing. But uh, change also is frightening for people, especially people who are frightened of change. There is a certain personality that uh, that I is think a certain tautology, actually. <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, and it applies to all kinds of things: uh, technology, mm -hmm. marijuana, cussing, everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The decline doesn't necessarily imply that we are going to <coughs> hell in a handbasket. In the case of tattoos, for example, I, I think I, I see that as more of a openness to a new kind of creative expression and also a advancement in tattoo design and aesthetics and consciousness that has uh, sort of made it more appealing to the general public and brought it into the mainstream, especially in the past 10 or 15 years. So tattoos, you're saying, are really no longer? They're, I'd Even say they're a, a little bit taboo, okay. but I, I'm in an interesting position having written my book first. It was published in 1997. And uh, at that time, tattoos were still sort of countercultural and taboo on some mm -hmm. level. Now, that it, and I updated the book in briefly in 2001 and then expanded it for this edition. And part of the reason I did that was because so much has happened in the past 15 years. Uh, the designs have, uh, have gotten more have broadened because the demographic has broadened, the technology has improved, the color has improved. Seriously, you've got to look at her book. Some of the <laughs> stuff they're doing is just <laughs> amazing. It is amazing. But These th aren't th actually fishnet hose. <laughs> 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 we worked on her before this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they've, they've fully entered the middle class. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing that's, mm -hmm. that's changed. And, and in because fact, of one that, thing that one thing that I've noticed in some of the pop culture criticism against tattooing is is that people who, who have tattoos, one of the pushbacks now is, oh, you know, you think you're a rebel because you have a tattoo, but come on. Yeah, and I did just read a statistic saying that 50% of people who get tattooed do think they're rebelling. <laughs> but whether, rather, you know, whether they're perceived as rebellious mm -hmm. or not at this point is okay. questionable. Well, and, and if, if people perceive themselves as rebelling when they tattoo, even though, oh, 50 even though so many people have tattoos now, they also feel like they're rebelling when they swear. Mm -hmm. And... Everybody swears at some yeah, point. Yeah, everybody swears at some point. Um, swearing, uh, I think people have the perception that it ha it has gotten much worse because of the internet and because you can just see so many swearing parrots and swearing <laughs> children and swearing, you know, everybody. Movies reduced to just their swear words. And so I think, you know, we really have a sense Movies with swear words in the title. Like, what the bleep do we know? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and, and it really is, you know, where everywhere. Whereas before the internet, you know, it was it wasn't published in books, you know, until the 1940s. It didn't appear in magazines, so mm. the only place you could have heard it was verbally. And so, uh, you know, now in it, my day, we had to learn <laughs> our profanity on the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that's where people get the sense that it's just we're being overwhelmed by. Experience. What do we lose when these things cease to be taboos? What do what do we what do we lose, and, and I, I, I particularly would want to start with you on that one. Well, with, I mean, with swearing, I think that we're, we're not going to lose linguistic taboos. I think they are in the process of changing. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, the sexual and excremental obscenities that we've sworn by for several hundred years now are, are, are actually losing their power, and that mm -hmm. the F word is now a word you can... I mean, it's still, it still is offensive to some people, but you can joke about it and you can say it, whereas racial slurs are mm -hmm. absolutely not funny. You can't, you know, say them. I mean, you really And really there's can't. no sense mm -hmm. of release to saying them. I mean, quite frankly, if I hit my, if I hit my hand with a hammer and, you know, mm -hmm. I drop a few up, I feel better. Yeah. You know, I don't have that if... And it wouldn't even occur to me to, you know, drop one of today's mm -hmm. taboo words. You know, the R, the N, the C, the the R and C. 
to get any sort of, I would not look to the RNC for any sort of emotional release. Yeah, yeah, not at this point. I think that in the future, probably that's where we're heading and that mm. eventually those those words will become used in a can more you Can you uh, speak literal. briefly to the research on, on profanity and pain? And pain, uh, yeah, yeah. So when she, when, she, when she says she, you know, it releases, it helps when you stub your toe. I mean, it really does. And scientists have found that, you know, you can you can hold your hand in cold water longer. <laughs> Sorry. You can hold your you can hold your hand in cold water longer um, if you're repeating a swear word than you can if you're repeating <laughs> a word like shoot. And <laughs> so it's, it's so been great. demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, I mean, what do you remember? What are the? It's not only if you repeat a swear word, but it ha you can't be. <sighs> If you you're a character a on an visual. HBO drama yeah. to begin with, it's not going to help. It exactly. has to be a swear word that with that one is meaningful to you. Yeah. You can't, you know, it's like bugger Vishnu or something, you know, if you're <laughs> not Hindu, it's not going to really do it. It's got to be something that's meaningful to mm -hmm. you and that you don't use often. Right. If you're a habitual swearer, it yes. doesn't work. So right. then you'd have to, right, you've got to go further into the realms of... How are you, how are you educating your child about swear words? I tell them that they should not swear, that they shouldn't swear, they sh especially should be very That's careful about, <laughs> about <laughs> swearing in public because people think that, you know, children, people have the idea that children are innocent and mm -hmm. for the most part, they most mostly are, and so that they need to, you know, use words that, that are appropriate for children. I do have to say one of the best um, stories I ever heard. A friend of mine said that when she was babysitting once that her one of her little charges, you know, dropped an F-bomb or something in front of her and, you know, immediately did the, you know, oh dear Lord, the heavens mm -hmm. are going to open up and swallow me face. And she just sort of looked at him and, and narrowed her eyes and said, you know, I don't know why this is. Everybody swears, but adults are not allowed to swear around kids and kids are not allowed to swear around adults. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he got it and yeah, he was like, yeah. all right. <laughs> I thought that was great. Okay, yeah. what have we lost as, what do we lose by marijuana becoming legal? <coughs> uh, becoming legal? Uh, well, we, I mean, we what lose we some, of the, uh, some of the forbidden fruit aspect mm -hmm. of, of marijuana's illegality. Mm -hmm. um, but we gain an awful lot as far mm -hmm. as moral stuff goes in mm -hmm. general uh, because when the laws don't really fit the standard moral pattern that we have in society, people tend to lose respect for those laws. If people are doing things every day, like driving on 128 at 75 miles per hour, then the moral impact of thinking that, oh, I should be driving 55, <coughs> all of a sudden starts to wane and disappear. And uh, uh, people are breaking the law all the, all the time, all left and right. Uh, and that's because the laws don't really match the general moral pattern of what's going on in society. And when that happens, people start to lose respect for the law. The impact of the idea that I'm being a lawbreaker, oh no, mm -hmm. disappears. Just right. like the impact of someone swearing. I mean, it used to be when said so someone dropped right. the F-bomb, everybody was shocked. And now everybody's, yeah, whatever. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. punctuation. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's, that's interesting. Do you see one thing that strikes me about that we were uh, talking about briefly is that there is no, one of the interesting things about marijuana entering perhaps the mainstream is that <coughs> there's no, the etiquette around it is the etiquette around secrecy. Oh, like um, you've never rolled up a towel and stuck it under a door. I mean, you, we know what we're well, talking about. You know, there's a sort of the code words. The yeah, thing when you're that, in that college, you know, I mean, this is a university it. situation. And we need so. But we need rituals around all sorts of things. And there, there kind of isn't because it's, it, I still don't perceive it as being the sort of thing that somebody could easily say, do you want a joint in the same way that if you were in my house, I would say, do you want a beer or a glass um, of wine? It depends on your social group. Okay. Uh, and that's changing. Uh, attitudes towards marijuana are changing. In fact, I just brought with me, I, I'm not going to read anything, I know that's a <laughs> terrible thing to do, but uh, the Pew Institute did just come out with a study and they were talking about uh, whether uh, smoking marijuana is a moral issue or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, it used to be that 50% of the people thought that smoking marijuana was morally wrong, mm -hmm. and that's now dropped to 32%, and now the 50% are people who think it is not a moral issue whatsoever. Well, now this brings, mm. this brings up another interesting topic regarding morality, and, mm -hmm. and we've been leaving you out, so I'm gonna, we talked about this briefly backstage, I'll kick this one off with you, which is almost everything we talk about in terms of taboos, and certainly everything 
or, or the majority of what all of you are writing about and experts on, are things that do not actually harm other people. Mm -hmm. And we increasingly have a sense of morality in America that really sort of begins and ends with, does this harm you, another person? And if not, then I have the right to do it, and you don't really have the right to say much. But almost everything that is a taboo is, that we talk about in, this, in the sense of taboos, is not necessarily harm-based. Your tattoos cannot possibly hurt me, except perhaps aesthetically, mm -hmm. um, in which case I can, I can look elsewhere. Right. So, so therefore, why would I be offended by your tattoos? Well, it's a good question. And let me just say, I'm actually People not tattooed. Are. I mean <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a journalist who writes about tattoos, but not because I was I'm saying your tattoos. And yeah, in a, it's in a global sense, you. But people, always, tattoos, people yeah. always make the assumption that because I write about tattoos, I'm somehow promoting them. But there is a, a, um, a saying in the tattoo world that the only difference between a tattooed person and an untattooed person is that uh, the tattooed person doesn't care whether you're tattooed or not. Only the untattooed person mm -hmm. makes the distinction and thinks about it. And honestly, uh, in all my research over the past 15 years, I interviewed tons of tattooed, you know, tattoo artists and tattoo people. Very few ever asked me, are you tattooed? As mm -hmm. if that was some kind of a badge Witness, or, you yes. know, that would that allow me into their world. Hmm. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, there, there's certainly a, a double standard between mm -hmm. the two. And, uh, and the bias just goes back so far. We think of it as a taboo going back, you know, historically for 100 years. It wasn't always such a taboo. In the 19th century, society women were tattooed with Victorian motifs and uh, little Florentine designs and the names of their husbands. And um, so it wasn't always, the, ta the mm -hmm. taboo is a, a class bias, mm -hmm. generally, that uh, the assumption that lo only lower class people got tattooed. And, and so, to my mind, that's the thing that's declining, and that's a good thing. Are there not, though, still, and, and that's, that's interesting right there. I mean, I think when you said that about the class, that to me hits it is there are tribal. I mean, you think taboo, and almost the next word that comes to your mind is tribe. And it seems like these mm -hmm. are things that kind of establish tribal mm -hmm. identities that, you know, by you know, by wearing a marijuana leaf pin or a flag pin or a cross or a whatever, you're, you're, in, you're indicating I'm, I'm this kind of person. And, and maybe that's the thing that is lost for tattooed people who liked that it was a countercultural designator that defined their tribe. That's do something you, do lost. Do you find, though, and this is something that I sort of picked up on in the latter parts of your book, that increasingly though you're still seeing class anxieties around tattoos but they're more around the kind of tattoos people get there's that i mean th are there are there differences in are there class based differences in the kinds of tattoos people get i think so i think that the as it sort of ascends through the middle mm -hmm. class and towards the upper classes, there's an, uh, more of an interest in um, abstract designs, custom designs. Uh, uh, you know, a sort of typical old school lower class tattoo would be more like, Mermaid. you know, an anchor, <laughs> an anchor. or a <laughs> pinup or some traditional folk motif. Mm -hmm. So there is that that distinction for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a distinction in uh, sort of professional people wearing tattoos. I interviewed an obstetrician who was heavily tattooed, who told me that, she talked about how as a professional woman, she can get away with being mm -hmm. tattooed in a way that say a waitress or a secretary mm -hmm. wouldn't. There was also, and there was a great article in The Onion, something about um, drugs now legalized for people who have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, hey, if you're a creative who just needs to unwind with a doobie at the end of a day, or a hard driving salesman who needs a line, that's fine. You know, it's, it's unemployed people. We well, don't with want. the welfare drug testing, uh, that may actually become the situation. Yes. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so, but uh, the fact is that uh, people who smoke marijuana, for instance, are most likely just as likely employed as people who don't smoke mm -hmm. marijuana. Uh, demographically, there's really very little difference uh, between. Except the employed Rwanda people are getting the better else. stuff. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Except the employed people can afford the better stuff. <laughs> but they can't find it because they don't have the. <laughs> 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 they don't have the time to go search. Yeah. <laughs> what about and 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 your book? You also mentioned an interesting class mm -hmm. distinction about swearing. Mm -hmm. So so talk to us about that because I I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, well, there there are these uh, these proverbs, you know, you t about swearing. You can swear like a lord or swear like a tinker. T 
tinker being a, a peddler, and that indicates that you know the people who historically, and those are hundreds of years old, those proverbs, people historically who have done the most swearing have been the people who have been of the kind of low classes and the aristocratic, you know, upper classes. And the, the idea being that the people in the lower classes didn't care or didn't know any better, and in the upper classes, they, they also didn't care. They didn't have to prove themselves to anyone. And, and so this is something that we sort of see across the world of all, all sorts of tabooed mm -hmm. activities, is that you see things that sort of percolate up. And you see this also, I interestingly, in fashion and in pop cultural trends as well. The things will sort of, s you know, you get street trends that then get picked up by the high taste makers and then mm -hmm. eventually may trickle into the middle. But the idea is that the people at the bottom don't have as much to lose, you know, don't have anything to lose. It's yeah. like, you know, I, I'm still gonna, you know, it's like, yeah, I can swear all the, you know, I'm a tinker. I'm hitting my hand with a hammer like all the time. <laughs> yes, I'm going to swear because I'm, you know, end of the day, I'm still gonna be a tinker. Uh, if you're a lord, same thing. With the tattoos, the people in the upper classes, professionals can afford their little drug habits, their little abstract body art habits. People at the bottom don't have as much to lose. But what I'm finding interesting is when you look at this, and this is an analysis that seems to hold true across so many things across time, but we're seeing increasing taboos breaking down at the point in American history where the middle class is disappearing and everybody is allegedly just consumed with class anxiety. So why aren't we all cleaning up our act in a huge way trying to pretend like we have job security? Well, I think some of this is just the, the general progress of humankind. Uh, He's the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, we've, we've shed slavery and mm -hmm. we've uh, allowed women the right to vote and uh, we've tried to fight racism. You didn't allow it, buddy. We fought for <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, you know, our societies. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we're still working on uh, trying to uh, get some degree of racial equality mm -hmm. and now we're allowing gay people to marry each other. So I think we are seeing these steps toward progressiveness as far as so society mm -hmm. goes. And we were talking about uh, classism and racism mm -hmm. and tribalism and all those things and how those things are being shed. Uh, well, that's very true with marijuana as well. It mm -hmm. used to be back in the 20s and 30s that marijuana was a, a Mexican drug. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was used by black jazz mm -hmm. musicians, and they were considered no, by I mean the, the whole press history, to the whole be history evil of marijuana people. panic is, is very much a racial That's right, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And, and it's the breakdown of the racial barrier. It's mm -hmm. the acceptance of black people as fellows in our mm -hmm. society that now allows us to say, hey, we all like marijuana. <laughs> And cussing and tat. Yeah, that's right. Well, this is another thing that I find interesting is, you know, when you talk about these things that are taboos, it's invariably the things that are also somewhat universal. I mean, body modification, body art, is, is there a culture that doesn't have it? Exactly. That I know, uh, not that, that I've ever heard of. And even the most conservative people will still trim their hair, wear, do something impermanent, if, if nothing else. I mean, the desire to decorate the body, the desire to decorate the consciousness, to decorate one's prose <laughs> <laughs> with profanity, <laughs> seems somewhat universal. For, so what is the psychology behind tabooing these things? Well, it was done pr on purpose in uh, the 20s, against marijuana, it was done on purpose in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and it was basically racism. It mm -hmm. was the society institutionalized racism, it started off with opium and Chinese people. We didn't, you know, they didn't like Chinese people and, and mm -hmm. so they started banning opium all over the place mm -hmm. to try and get rid of Chinese people. And they did the same thing with marijuana. They wanted to get black people and Spanish people and discriminate against them using the law. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And it's still today that same way. Uh, over 50% of the prisoners in Massachusetts prisons right now mm -hmm. for drug crimes are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And for tattoos, I mean, it, it, there are a number of ways that it became taboo. One was when the electric uh, tattoo machine was invented in 1891. A lot of people quickly went out and got full body suits, entered the circus, made their living this mm -hmm. way. And, and they were poor people who were mm -hmm. trying to make a living. So, so the, the class bias entered there, and then a health bias entered in the mid 20th century when a, a hepatitis outbreak was linked to the use of dirty tattoo needles. Then it was outlawed in many states and uh, 
only recently, I think the last state was Oklahoma, where tattooing was legal, legalized. Each state with their own regulations. It was regulations. only legalized here, not in Massachusetts, not that. It's 2008. Really? Okay. Yeah. And in yeah. New York, I think it was 97, 98. Uh, so it was sort of a slow process when you think that, that you know, it was outlawed in mid-century, mm -hmm. and it took that long. And it's not that hard to require that people wear gloves and use sterilized needles right. and ensure that it's not going to be a health hazard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess maybe I'm less of an optimist about our disappearance. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. <coughs> but I mean, you know, I, I think one, one taboo that's definitely increasing is the taboo against adultery. Um, especially in America, which is, you know, whether or not you think that's a step backward or a step forward, it's definitely much stronger now. It's, and I think it has to do with the middle class that you say is disappearing. It's, you know, f in Britain, upper class Brits, I mean, it was, it was in the sort of 1910, 1920, just perfectly acceptable for married couples to have well, you know Stanford other partners just got swing elect just oh, got elected so yeah sorry I, w what about the sanford election i mean i'm not you know the oh <laughs> yeah well that's that's odd he was sort of the <laughs> the only guy running wasn't he his sort of part his, the person running against him was sort of not not really present in the election and that seemed more to do with republicanism and electing the guy who was there than than the taboo against mm. adultery but and I don't think we're ever going to get rid of, you know, incest, um, pedophilia, you know. Well, those are, t again, yeah. though, those are harm-based taboos, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as opposed to simply funny, yeah. taboos that are based on a notion of something being sacred well, or something that we simply don't do, even though we can't define why we don't do it. And the, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist... Oh gosh, I think he's a Duke. I could be very wrong about that, but he is a psychologist, I know that much. <laughs> and he's written about different foundations of morality and that those that we all have, all people seem to have in common are fairness and avoiding harm. But there is a sense of, of sacredness and lack of contamination and in-group loyalty <laughs> as moral standards that some people seem to have and others don't. Mm -hmm. So what I'm sort of curious about is and I think sort of for me, an existential question really is, can we keep what's good about the notion of sacredness and taboos mm -hmm. while getting rid of all the harmful stuff? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think humans can transcend tribalism necessarily. I mean, maybe we, we can stop being racist and prejudiced, but we're always gonna have that sense of, you know, oh, these are people like me. Mm -hmm. I wanna hang out with these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Is there some way we can keep I think about, in my junior high, we had... <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, we had clicks, but it was a, we, we had like a, a, a mosaic of the school mascot on the floor of the lobby, and no one ever walked on it. Mm -hmm. And it was this thing that you just, you know, you would see this entire group of people just, you know, swarming around this thing, even in the busiest, m I mean, even if you know, there was a fire drill or something, you would just, and that was special. Mm -hmm. There was something about the taboo of not walking on that mosaic that made us stronger as a group. Can we keep that group enhancing, sacredness enhancing aspect of taboos and get rid of the harm factor? Yes or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think with swearing, you know, certainly with some of the sexual obscenities, which, you know, now you would argue don't harm people, although Victorians probably would have argued differently. Um, you know, you, you can, and they, they are, uh, I mean, people do use swear words to preserve this kind of very kind of group identity that you're talking about, where people will swear together, you mm -hmm. know, like workers against yeah. management, and that helps. That that's a lovely, yeah. another lovely study is that they found mm -hmm. that profanity in the workplace actually enhances morale and group cohesion as long as it's profanity done in the backstage area against the customers. <laughs> I mean, yeah. having your boss, li like having your boss cuss you out yeah, is not yeah, going right, to improve your morale, yeah. but having your boss like come back to the kitchen and say, man, could you believe that, you know, at <laughs> table three is going to do wonders for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it seems to be all about context. I mean, with the cursing, I have a friend who is a compulsive, curses like a sailor, but it's not nasty. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it's colorful. <laughs> and I wonder if that's a distinction in your, in your research. 
Um, Abusive I, language versus colorful versus language. Colorful or language. Or I mean, it is interesting that the same, you know, you use the same words for both. I mean, unless you're talking about racial slurs, but the same sexual obscenities could be used, right, for group cohesion or to But one thing that is out. so interesting, I think, about, again, tats, weeds, and cussing is is that all of these things, they are taboos, but they've also, th they serve so many different purposes that swearing, and th th I mean, the title of your book, Holy Shit, is not, a, is, is not just random. I mean, it's that yeah. swears are usually about either the holy mm -hmm. or about shit. Yeah. You know, the, the literally, you know, the, pr the sacred or the yeah. profane. Mm -hmm. and, and you look at the purposes that swearing in the sense of oath making, mm -hmm. in the sense of, cursing you know m may it smell from your head like it smells from my feet that kind of that kind of cursing yeah. cussing people out profanity you look at all of those different types that still get pulled together under swears and likewise with with the tattoos i mean some of them have religious meanings they're meant to symbol you know this is the thing that's going to get you into the afterlife mm -hmm. with some it's you know to commemorate a particular event in their life military service or surviving cancer for some people. It's purely artistic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so many, and, and the same with any kind of drug use, is that it can be recreational, it can be medicinal, spiritual. All of these things are so uh, polysimous in, mm -hmm. you know, s have so many different uses and meanings. Yeah, and each one of those uh, kinds yeah. of permutations of them ha can create groups of, of followers that become mm -hmm. those tribes, that become those cultures. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have uh, a group that uses mar marijuana as a sacrament, mm -hmm. like the uh, Rastafarians mm -hmm. down in Jamaica do. I'm sure they have a great sense of, uh, of group cohesion mm -hmm. when they're sitting around passing a giant uh, spleef. One would mm -hmm. hope so. Yeah, if they didn't, one would wonder what the point was. <laughs> Getting high, maybe. <laughs> well, similarly, with, with tattoos, they're sort of adaptive. I, I'm interested in seeing the way they're claimed by different groups. Mm -hmm. There are people who use activist tattoos. I met a student who was doing a whole paper on um, activists who use tattoos as symbols of their veganism or their HIV status or whatever. Um, other people are using them as forms of therapy. There's a man in Chicago who tattoos people who've been men and women who've been in uh, coming out of gangs or dangerous situations mm. who've been scarred or burned or shot or degradingly tattooed. And his process is to work them through a, a sort of therapy session that can go on for 15 weeks and then tattoo over the mark. And his, he deliberately doesn't uh, re encourage them to remove the mark. The idea it. is that you, you have it for life, wow. the experiences with you, but you can transform it, mm -hmm. yes. So it's interesting how different people um, sort of claim it for their different purposes. Um, there are many horrible degrading uses of tattoos um, in, you know, sec with uh, sex trafficking, people tattooed with numbers that represent mm -hmm. how much money they owe their pimps before they're gonna be free. Men, there's just an article, CBS just did a piece on uh, uh, unfortunately high number of men who use tattooing as a form of domestic abuse um, tattooing their names mm -hmm. on women that they've violated or abused. And so that's, that would be the taboo that should remain, that we don't do, but at the other end of the spectrum, the people who are able to express themselves or commemorate things or celebrate their bodies um, would be uh, a, a new kind of freedom that is uh, a great development, mm -hmm. I think. Wonderful. Well, let's open Questions up to the audience. And there are, see microphones there and there. And speak into them, please, clearly and concisely and eloquently <laughs> and from your very heart, <laughs> go. Well, thank you for coming. It's been a very interesting discussion. I, I have two questions, actually. One for um, the woman who wrote the book. I'm sorry, I'm bad with names, but um, wrote the book about tattoos. I'm just mm -hmm. curious if you have statistics on, because I have friends who got tattoos, and granted, they're white-collar professionals, so maybe this goes into the socioeconomic issues you were talking about, but I'm wondering how many people, people I've known have gotten tattoos and then have had, had to spend thousands of dollars on laser treatments to remove them, like they regretted the decision afterwards, and I'm curious how many people that you know have gotten tattoos and later regretted the decision? What percentage? I don't know. Yeah, you know, there is a statistic in my book, and I just can't remember it. Uh, 
but the, the highest number of women who regret and remove the tattoos are younger, middle-class white women, for whatever reason. I mean, maybe those are just the highest number of people getting tattooed to begin with. They can also uh, not afford to remove them. Right, yeah, <laughs> you have to be able to afford it. And so there is that, for sure. There's a uh, lot of people out there who change their minds. I just read an article by a woman, I think in her 50s, who said, she got tattooed in her 30s or late 20s at a time when she felt like she was old enough to know what she was doing. She you know, was in her career. She wasn't going to regret it, but she did regret it. She just didn't like it 20 years later, and that's the risk of getting tattooed. And, and, um, the, and, and something you said earlier, I just wonder, you were saying how people, how the, the people that are in more formal professions, they don't have the luxury of waitresses and stuff as far as tattoos, something like that, right? Mm -hmm, oh. Yeah. Okay, I was just, my, my second question is for the gentleman um, in the middle. Uh, my question is this, uh, I understand um, the history behind marijuana and, and why you wanted to have it legalized, but what do you say to the argument that the documentation that it does ne it kill brain cells, it has a negative impact on developing brains, you know, teenage brains, and it's not like I know it has benefits for older people with Alzheimer's, but, I mean, the fact that once you legalize a drug, it does obviously cause more prevalent use and experimentation in the public. And so, and then, you know, obviously you can't unlegalize it after that. And, and so I'm just wondering in terms of... I bet he's know, got that, an answer. I bet he's looking for it right Sure. Now. Well, no, I don't need to look it up. I know <laughs> the answer. Uh, you've said a lot of things. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> where to start. You're going to have to repeat some of them, too, because I can't re remember all that stuff. <laughs> 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 Head start. Uh, the, the idea that uh, we'll be here all week. Don't the idea that uh, cannabis destroys brain cells is uh, drug warrior rhetoric. It's just ridiculous. Uh, there was a book written, Marijuana Myths, Marijuana Facts, by doctors Lynn Zimmer, who's a sociologist, and Dr. John Morgan from City, uh, uh, mm -hmm. City College uh -huh. of New York, and uh, he's a, uh, a, <coughs> a pharmacologist. And they addressed all of these silly myths, including uh, that it'll shrink your testicles and that it'll <laughs> cause your baby to have deformities and that it'll kill your brain cells and cause breast growth in men, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list goes on and on and on of all these absolutely ridiculous fallacies that have been put out as part of dr drug war propaganda. And let me assure you, it's just not true. The idea that, uh, the idea that all of a sudden after prohibition is gone, all these people are going to start smoking marijuana that hadn't done so before is based on the idea that the prohibition is somehow effective. And I would maintain that the prohibition is almost completely ineffective. That if you want to get marijuana, our society is knee-deep in marijuana, despite the fact that it's prohibited. The only thing that's going to change is that people who are now considered criminals are no longer going to be considered criminals. You're not going to see an awful lot more of them out there. So there's no negative impact on the brain for, for younger people who use and abuse it? Well, sir, oh. nobody is saying that young people oh, yeah. should use marijuana. In fact, nobody's saying that people should use marijuana, period. All I'm saying is that adults who choose to use marijuana as a safe recreational substance, much safer, let me point out, than alcohol, uh, that they should be allowed to do so. That has nothing to do with children. Okay. Other questions? Yes, someone on the other side. Well, you mentioned the sacred and the and the profane, but you did not take up the religious theme. Uh, in most Islamic societies, uh, tattoos are uh, haram mm -hmm. because they disfigure uh, the body that Allah gave you, and that's a view that's uh, shared by most uh, traditional Christian and uh, Jewish denominations. Uh, it's also haram in most Muslim contexts uh, to smoke or to use of intoxicants. Mm -hmm. uh, in traditional Christian and Jewish uh, circles, it's not strictly forbidden because it <coughs> It arose after those texts mm -hmm. were written, but it's not encouraged either. And of course, in all religions, it's strictly forbidden to uh, take the name of the Lord in vain or to use blasphemy. So actually, what we're seeing is pagan practices. In animist and naturalist religions, some of these practices are actually part of the ritual. Uh, so in traditional monotheistic religions, uh, these are the kind of practices that have been traditionally suppressed. So what, what this really seems to indicate, more than a breaking of taboos, 
is the kind of secularization of society and the breakdown of traditional religious values. Where people have strong religious values, you may see some of this, but you well, see much less. Well, people have strong Abrahamic religious values. I mean, tattooing right. is, well, well, and marijuana well, are, in fact, religious sacraments in, 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 in very traditions. fringe types of cults. But I, I mean, actually, in actually, religions. hash oil was what was in the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem. Boy, that just explains so much of Ezekiel, <laughs> i got to tell you. <laughs> uh, hash oil is a sacrament of the Jewish religion. Well, that's an interesting thing, but again, as we were saying, that like, the things that are tabooed are the flip side of the things that are sacred. Mm -hmm. That, you know, swearing by the Lord is not, it, it has no impact if one yeah. does not believe. I mean, this is why swearing by religious deities that you don't believe in, it's not going to give me any kind of thing to swear by about or by Muhammad or Vishnu. Yeah, no, and I would definitely so. agree that mm -hmm. the, the, the fact that religious oaths now are not powerful, I mean, in the, in the Middle Ages when everybody was Catholic in England, I mean, they were incredibly powerful and in fact were much worse than obscene words, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I, I agree that the, the, the fact that we no longer swear with religious words definitely indicates the sort of declining mm -hmm. prevalence and I impact of Judeo-Christian religion. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen on the other, we're keeping it so nice and <laughs> symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> Tattoos don't affect me directly. It really has no significance to me. Uh, swearing, gratuitous swearing, is kind of silly and doesn't do anything except uh, portray the swearer, someone who can't express himself in a more elevated language, so that person stands to be judged. But I want to ask you about the pothead people. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a pretty good job in driving out cigarette smokers from public places because of their stench. Uh, pot smokers are no less obnoxious in their stench. Do you foresee a time when you people would like to inflict your smelly stench <laughs> on the rest of us? Or would you, Do like you keep it to yourself in your own private places, which is that's, preferable? If one could put that in perhaps more civil language, that's a really interesting question because just as tolerance of marijuana, tolerance of cigarette smoke has gone way down. Very true. Do you think, and the fact that, you know, marijuana is not an easily hideable drug. It's not like, you know, cocaine that can, you know, exist in this tiny little thing. First so of all, just to put everybody at ease, my issue is not allowing people to blow smoke in other people's face. <laughs> My issue is trying to keep people who smoke marijuana from going to jail or getting fined or anything like that. As far as, as, far as public smoking and people interfering with other people, as far as their smoke interfering with other people, it's just like with cigarettes. We've, society is finding a way to deal with cigarette smokers by isolating them, and I'm sure that marijuana smokers are going to be at least as isolated, if not more so. It's an interesting thing with... Um, do you think, and this is, uh, I've, I've been really struck by the extent to which technology has played in with all of these things, that the internet has sort of de-tabooed profanity, that the electric tattoo machine. Mm -hmm. And the internet. And the, in and the internet the changed internet. all of that, that Craigslist and the existence of vaporizers and all of these things are going to presumably... Right, and edible yeah. marijuana products and drinkable marijuana products, things like that. So you don't necessarily have to interfere with other people with smoke all around you. You can consume marijuana other ways. All right. And do you avoid a health hazard by not smoking it? Uh, you do, but the health hazard associated with smoking marijuana has been greatly overemphasized by those who want to continue the war it's against marijuana the health, the health hazards associated with anything always do... I, I mean, health... Health dialogue is one way we talk about moral mm. problems. It's, it's bad right. for, you know, what, oh, tattoos, aren't they dirty? Mm. You know, aren't they? We, we always talk around this Actually, language Actually, there's of a slight anti-cancer effect from some of the cannabinoids and cannabinols and cannabinoids in marijuana, and it's been shown that there is no uh, precursor cancer cells associated with the use of marijuana. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, th this subject, and particularly your issues, are, are ones that are very near and dear to my heart. Everybody in my household swears <laughs> all the time while I run and hide. Um, uh, my kids uh, smoke pot. They think it's wonderful. My husband has no problem with it. Um, and my oldest has a, a huge tattoo on her side. I want to party <laughs> with you. It's going to follow soon, soon after. But um, uh, I, I do feel that there's a, a, a distinction as between your issues that hasn't been raised and that I thought might be 
interesting the, the, for the women, particularly because I do. It, to me, your the tattoo and the swearing issue are perhaps dignity issues, if you will, mm -hmm. and that it's something that while men have always gotten tattoos and men have always sworn, and it seems all right for them, it seems that something it's something that women now that it's more acceptable um, for women to get tattoos and for women to swear. Um, and I wonder if it's one of those things that it's sort of a false kind of equality mm -hmm. that frankly do we really want to be that <laughs> equal to do we want to all get drunk and throw up and fall on the you know fall on the street after a party is it really something that we want to go in that direction i wonder if that might be addressed uh, or just the distinction between when men and women as a sexist issue might be addressed and as far as the uh, the marijuana issue one uh, issue that you didn't address was uh, i think you touched on it was the um was uh, legally i mean i don't want a, a physician um operating on me while he's high but i assume he knows that um the issue of making it illegal for younger people that while as soon as alcohol became legal i think um they did set limits for alcohol and that doesn't seem to be in the conversation and i do think that that's that is a subject that this other gentleman was touching on young people i'm sorry this lady was touching on with young people whether that makes sense just because young people are stupid and we need to <laughs> you know we have to tell no, them to go to school we have to, to tell them, them more stupid you know to uh, in, a, in many ways what to do and that perhaps well um well what you're saying about adults makes sense maybe there should be some attempt at legally at at putting limits on what kids can do. I, I've never heard anyone discuss the regu uh, regulation of marijuana and include the idea that children should be allowed to smoke it. No, That's but they don't address Even in the that legalization that movement, that would be anathema. Yeah. Actually, one, one thing that I've generally heard as an argument for legalization is that once it's no longer, once you no longer have this cultural hypocrisy of many people doing it, but it's officially illegal, therefore nobody can talk about it, you'd be able to do more straightforward well, education. The way it is right now, the person who sells marijuana to a child doesn't check for IDs. He doesn't stand to lose his marijuana distribution license for selling to someone who's underaged. Uh, if we regulated it, then maybe it would be harder for kids to get uh, marijuana but so than much it is easier for them, for them to them get to alcohol. Right now, it's much easier for them to get marijuana than it is for them to get alcohol. It would be cigarettes. so much harder for them to get marijuana and so much easier for them to sell their Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> it would be a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. What about gender? You two, I, talk quickly about I gender. Think that, that's I think a good you're, you're definitely right with the swearing, that women now are swearing much more, and that <laughs> men also words that you know used to apply only to women are starting to be applied to men, and that's another sort of gendered... And women thing, are like using it against other women, you know, and, and using it against other women too. Yeah, um, and and I think you're talking to talking to younger women, I'm 39, and talking to women in their you know 20s, I say, well, there has historically been this idea that women weren't supposed to swear, and they they really to a woman are like, really, really, I swear, <laughs> you know, How and they they, <laughs> they they really oh, don't don't kind of get that that used to be more taboo even you know 20 years ago. Um, and as to whether whether we should should stop it, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, it's it's kind of the the same thing. Well, should we stop women from trying to kill themselves at work? Not not kill themselves, but you know, work incredibly hard to you know become the CEO of some. You know, is that a is that a smart life choice for women? You know, it's it's sort of it, to me, it feels like well, women should get to be dumb in the same way. Exactly, women mm -hmm. should get to be dumb in the same way as men. <laughs> yeah, I am right. I am bothered by the fact that there are no um, that I know of at any rate female stoner comedies. That, you know, while, while actually you, you only spoke about these right. two things, I don't That's think there's a taboo against women smoking marijuana, but I do That's think I there's a, think so. there's kind of an archetype of, you know, the dude bro stoner, the Cheech and Chong that, you know, you just do not see. Mm -hmm. for women tattoos for women because well, that's really your yeah that's a rich subject i uh, two points one when i started doing my research in the in the 90s this was the end of the culture wars and at the time i noticed a lot of women tattoo getting tattooed i saw that it was a time when we were debating a lot of women's body issues in the media um, surrogate motherhood abortion date rape cosmetic surgery breast implants breast cancer and at the time I started my research, I noticed that a lot of women who were getting tattooed were expressing a sort of impulse to control their own representation, their own self-presentation, and it seemed like a healthy thing, that they were defining their own sense of beauty. And I'd say even n more so today, when we're, our culture is obsessed with women's bodies. Men's magazines have women's bodies on the cover. 
women's magazines have women's bodies on the cover. And there's a lot of pressure on women to uh, present themselves in a particular way and to be beautiful in a very restricted, uh, on, along a very restricted definition um, in terms of body type and ethnicity. I think tattooing gives women an opportunity to, to define beauty for themselves and to pick individual imagery and designs uh, that express their own definition of beauty and can be presented publicly or privately. So it allows them a lot of I choice. If I could just follow briefly on that. Um, but it's not like getting a new hairdo or changing your right. nail polish. There's a permanency about mm -hmm. tattooing, which is what I find offensive about it. To me, it suggests that the person is never going to change or grow. Today, I want this on my arm, but it's, uh, but it, it's you know, it, it might be just that you get tired just of it. But people change I, and... I have to push back on that. Just because the picture is there forever, just because the image is there forever, doesn't mean that you're reading of the image. It's, it doesn't mean that it's not going to grow. It simply means that, uh, you know, the meaning of it may change over time, but you always want to be in a relationship with that image. And I think the bigger problem comes with women who get heavily tattooed at a young age. I, I interviewed middle-aged women who were heavily tattooed, either artists or just tattooed women, who um, expressed concern about women in their 20s getting, you know, full sleeves and a lot of work partly because they don't know who they're going to be yet, they don't know what their profession's going to be yet, and also just, you know, in, in tattoo terms, they're filling their canvases too fast. You know, mm. <laughs> you've got to save some space for later life I if mean, you're going to be... It, yes, you were saying it can be distracting. I can barely watch an NBA game. I mean, the players are just running out <laughs> yeah. of... Thank you. The players are running out of skin, and, and that one... Well, the guy with the hair and the... <laughs> but it's, it's starting to really extend, and I'm not, I'm not sure why the, the league doesn't do something about that. Uh, why would they? How is it in any way affecting their playing? Uh, just as a dignity thing with baseball. You know, the certain ways, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a man, I didn't make these rules up, but uh, there's a certain, I guess, dignity about the play. Huh. That's what my husband says, that like baseball players can't have long hair or some of the, some of the teams control facial hair. <laughs> have they told? <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but anyway, but thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Interesting topic. Hi, I was wondering if there's a global, this is a question for all of you, if there's a global perspective to your research and your work, and if so, what are the commonalities and distinctions that you discovered? I think we should all say, you know, could we all agree that, like, nobody should be able to swear, get tattoos, or smoke weed if they're under 35? <laughs> like, once you're over 35, just go nuts. <laughs> Whatever you want. But just before then, not. Uh, you're asking about the international perspective on marijuana, for instance. Uh, I think that a lot of people in the world were incredibly shocked to see Colorado and Washington legalize the adult use of marijuana uh, because America had been this, this drug war behemoth. It seemed as though you know, it was America that was controlling the war on drugs in the whole world. You know, when you, from, a, from a perspective of any other small country in the world, they look at us and they say, wow, that's, that's the huge, huge monster America, and they're fighting drugs. And then all of a sudden when the word goes out that, you know, the, that big monster has a little part right in the middle of it that doesn't want to fight drugs anymore, I think that really shocked a lot of people in the world. Mm. Uh, and it certainly got a lot of the people at the UN down there thinking pretty quick because we actually have this international treaty where we're supposed to not, uh, where none of the consigners of this treaty are supposed to allow legalized marijuana. And the um, United States is a member of that treaty, and we're in violation of it. And that's not a big surprise. We violate treaties every day. Uh, <laughs> and I guess it doesn't mean too much. But the UN thinks it it's a big deal, and they have this drug policy task force, and they're all, oh, my God, they're going to legalize marijuana. What an awful thing. So yeah, that's the international mm -hmm. prospect. You, you've got normal people in the other countries, they say, wow, America isn't as big and stupid as we thought. And then you've got all the UN people and all the drug regulators, the people who have a stake in the drug war, and they're all completely panicking. Mm -hmm. um, international profanity. International Task profanity, force. yeah. Well, that I, yeah, I don't <laughs> know about the, the rates at which people swear. I mean, p there, are, you know, there are certainly some commonalities with swearing in, in different languages. You know, um, a lot of countries. Do you, do you find how popular have you have you done any research on swearing in foreign languages? 
Okay. I mean, in other words, yeah. do people in China like to say fuck? Because that, that's a way of swearing, but it doesn't actually give them like the feeling of breaking a taboo in their own language. Yeah, no, that they, yeah, that definitely happens. Because people who speak more than one language or people mm -hmm. who are just familiar with English, yeah, the, the real taboo words are their native mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. And so the a lot of people like in Sweden where there's a power, they're kind of one of their more powerful words is the devil. And they, they, they like to use mm -hmm. the F word because they, they yeah. Yeah, feel it's just a better, a better yeah. word. <laughs> Mayor, or something like it feels yeah. good to um, but, but yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, and they kind of, uh, there's it's sort of what you might expect in a lot of sort of Middle Eastern and Spanish speaking cultures, you know, female honor is much more source of swearing, um, you know, a lot of things against your sister and your mother. Um, and in uh, in Japan, it has a lot to do with status. You know, that calling someone stupid is a much worse insult than it is here because huh. that's a you know loss of face. Um, so there are some some interesting things that way. Yeah, international tax. Well, I can't yeah, comment on it because my research is specifically on Western traditions, and there's just such a huge volume of you know so many different cultures with so many different tattoo traditions beyond ours. What do you think of, though, then just to, to pull an international cross-cultural perspective, the trend of white people getting tattooed with kanji characters yeah. or people, you know, uh, using Maori designs? I mean... Yeah, the Maori one is a little sensitive. I have done research there and interviewed people it's about the... Fairly revival. offensive to... Yeah, to take a traditional, yeah. especially, a, and, and what a cultural reversal there. In our culture, tattoos are defined as or, you know, in the past 50 years have been considered countercultural. Mm -hmm. In Maori culture, it's very traditional, and you don't get a tattoo unless you talk to your elders and get it approved and make sure you're doing it right. So the kind of appropriation of those images here is a little offensive, and, uh, and it's just interesting to see that the difference in the meaning there being, you know, the meaning there being something so different in its cultural value than here. Just one random example, and then you know, every country varies in its history and its traditions. Okay. One uh, more question, and then um, this question is for all of you, but particularly concerning tattooing. Um, in terms of employment, when you go for a job, you're going to be interviewed. I mean, do these? You're saying it's becoming more acceptable in the professions and upper class. Do people hide their tattoos, and do they people not do. swear or what? <laughs> I think with the tattoos, it still it does affect your job prospects, and some companies do say, mm -hmm. like Disney, uh, does not allow people to show tattoos um, if they if they work for Disney. Uh, you know, it's actually funny. One thing about tattoos in particular that always struck me is people in the performing arts tend to violate a lot of taboos. Mm -hmm. They tend to, be, I, I mean, you know, actors and singers mm -hmm. and all of this have always you know been the riffraff of society, and they've always been the taboo violators, but with tattoos in particular, they tend not to, mm -hmm. because you know you don't want to have to remove them every <laughs> now right. and make up over them. Yeah, actually, I, like, I think Angelina Jolie talked about yes. how as an actress, she she's fairly tattooed and she likes tattoos because she ha part of her job requires being somebody else mm -hmm. all the time, and the mm. tattoos m individualize her body. Um, but one point about the workplace, uh, a, a woman I interviewed in San Francisco, an artist, does all black and gray uh, geometric designs, and she told me she has no hipsters in her shop, no countercultural people, it's all corporate people from Google and Visa coming to her, <laughs> day and night, getting, and big designs, you know, not just little delicate uh, butterflies or whatever. But uh, it, it does, to your question, it does have an impact. And I think it does limit some people's job possibilities if the tattoos are visible on the hands or the neck or wherever. N probably the same with swearing, but people would <laughs> yeah. be less likely probably um, to swear in a job interview. Right, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably keep it even under though it's supposedly <laughs> becoming It does help them remember you. <laughs> right, yeah. even, th even though it's supposedly becoming more acceptable, it's not... Yeah, no, not in that context, certainly not, yeah. Right. Yeah. And and you know, don't light up. If you're gonna boy. yeah, if you're gonna light up, don't bogart. <laughs> right. That's well, like, you, know. It, you know, interesting <laughs> to that point is that uh, you know we had a lot of pre-employment drug screening that went on, especially through mm. this this the beginning part of this century, and now many companies are dropping pre-employment drug screenings for all it's sorts of drugs. Not, not, not worthwhile. Mm. Really, for all sorts of drugs. That's right. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Well.
Thank you to everybody, and I believe there'll be a book signing outside. Thank you.